glorified. He also glorified. Music has stopped. I've been given a thumbs up from the uh, control booth. So, hey, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you guys today. A little bit of trivia this morning. In 1973, four people were taken hostage and held in a bank vault for six days. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about so far. We got one back here. After six days upon their release, when the police finally got in, these hostages began to defend their captors to the point where they even started to raise money for the people that literally held them captive in a bank vault for six days. The media labeled this as a syndrome. Anybody know what the syndrome is called? Stockholm Syndrome, yes. So this became a Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is the psychological condition in which we begin to defend or even um, prioritize our captors. Stockholm Syndrome is a condition in which we uphold these things that hold us captive as if they are somehow good to us. The reason why I tell that story is the first song I want to do this morning is called Free in You. This is a song about how Christ has set us free. So many of us in this world today have what I would call a spiritual Stockholm Syndrome. We are held captive and even defend the very things that hold us captive, even though we know they are not good for us. And this first song is about Christ setting us free so that we don't have to be held captive to those things. Lies replace these scars with who I am, with who you are. 
For the cross you loose the chains Made me your child no longer slave And I'm set free Oh Lord I'm set free Oh Lord I'm set free I'm free in you Let me out to draw me near Bound me to love and not to fear Through all the earth your freedom rings Release my soul and now I sin And I'm set free Oh Lord, I'm set free Oh Lord, I'm set free I'm free in you. I'm set free. Oh Lord, I'm set free. Oh Lord, I'm set free. I'm free in you. Bind up the brokenhearted and bring down the walls of darkness. You have come to set the captives free. You bind up the brokenhearted and bring down the walls of darkness. You have come to set the captives free. You bind up the brokenhearted. And bring down the walls of darkness You have come to set the captives free And I'm set free Oh Lord, I'm set free Oh Lord, I'm set free I'm free in you And I'm set free Oh Lord, I'm set free Oh Lord, I'm set free I'm free set free oh lord i'm set free oh lord i'm set free i'm free in you I worship you, I worship you. 
worship you. You are here, healing every life. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. Good morning. morning. Just want to say thanks to Matt and Doug for leading us in worship this morning. My name is Amy Singer, and I am glad to welcome you here to Watkins United Methodist Church. Whether you're in person or if you're online, I'm glad glad you're here. Um, If you are online, then I invite you to give a shout out, saying you know hello, and um, so that we know that you're there. And if you're in person, we have these connect cards in the pew. I invite you to fill them out. Um, If you um, have any prayer requests, there's a spot on the back. Um, And if you're online, there is a um, spot on the website. You can do that also. So if you would now join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here together to worship you. We have had some chaotic couple of weeks and... I'm so glad to be here um, where I can give my burdens to you and I'm thankful that you set us free from those burdens. 
Thank you for being a promise keeper, Lord. Thank you for being there for us always, just, uh, just a breath away. It's in your heavenly name we pray, amen. Now, if you'd like to stand and greet your neighbor. Good morning. I'll say it again. Can I have my, my friends come down? Owen and Maverick and you guys and everybody. Oh, there you are. And Jackson is coming. Okay, okay. I tell you what, this is going to be different because I'll, I'll explain why. But I'm going to sit over here and you guys are going to be there and the magic word is what oh well you're almost already sitting do you remember what it is Hi. cheeseburger Cheese yes so can you all sit down fries. oh fries too how about a coke yeah let's let's do that yes do you know why i have to sit over here today because i work maybe too much in my yard yesterday it was so nice and so pretty so I got the mailbox oh you did you did yes did you I have to turn the soil and then I hoe it and then I spade it and then I turn it again. It takes me forever. Your dog? No, Oh. Boomer has a boo-boo? 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, I've got a question for you. This is getting out of control. I'm going to bring it in. I got to bring it in, you guys. Okay, Jackson, hold my hand. So when you plant a garden, do you just do you just put it in the ground and say, "You're on your own." There you go. No, you have to give it water and food. Oh, I used a different kind of food this year. I I did my osma coat, but I also did an alfalfa food for flowers. So so they have a better chance. It's still me with the water. You know, I usually get the message when they're all wilted. You want a lemon plant? Lemon plants are good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. I got, oh, cheeseburger. Cheeseburger. Cheeseburger, yes, and crunchy chicken. Okay. But... Okay, just like, you know, you know what? Let's let's just say a prayer. Let's 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 just. We're gonna go. Let's. Can we bow our heads? Hey, Maverick. Let's sit down and and we're gonna pray for just a second and then we'll go. Okay, Jackson, sit down, please. Okay. Good morning, Lord. I I am so thrilled to have such great and creative and wonderful young people with us. Please plant in us the fruits of your spirit and be with us as our friend, our guide, and and be with us always. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes. It feels like we had some extra Easter candy around somewhere. <laughs> Does anybody else wish they had that much energy this morning, right? They're doing great. Well, we are so glad you're here, whether you're visiting here in person or you're online with us today. Um, we are, are better when we are together here in this place. Um, what a week, right? What a week. What a week. Uh, I want to give some time of acknowledgement and some time of prayer around the events that happened this past week and some room. I think space is important for us as we remember and as we continue to wrestle with the, our obsession with gun violence here in the United States. As we, I, I don't know if you know this, but uh, with mass shooting on Monday with five dead and eight injured. And then, then last night, you probably have seen the shooting at Chickasaw Park with two dead and four injured. That marks 146 mass shooting this year. 146. We have a problem, don't we? We have an issue that calls for prayer, sure, and action as well. You know, I think as Christians, and I don't think, just think, I believe and I trust that we as those who follow Jesus Christ reflect God's reconciling love to all we encounter. Would you agree? Sure, sure. And I also believe that we as United Methodists, this is from our social principles, recognize our commitment to become faithful witnesses to the gospel, not alone to the ends of the earth, but also to the depths of common life and work. Common life and work. You know, I, we can't help but see the brokenness in this world. And sometimes I believe that brokenness can cause us to feel uh, paralyzed. Have you felt that in this past week? Or maybe we become overwhelmed with maybe the events that has happened and we, we just don't know where to start. We may feel trapped in this cycle that we find ourselves in once again, but that doesn't excuse us. It doesn't excuse us for, for being a part of God's healing work in this world that transforms relationships, but also transforms our systems to pursue justice and peace amongst people, communities, and nation. And that includes our own city of Louisville. 
can't let things just overwhelm us and we move on. We can't think the problem is just too great, so we shall do nothing. We find ourselves maybe even discouraged by public discourse in the world. We become discouraged of, of people who use their voices and we may not necessarily agree with what's going on. We have lost what it means to engage in civic conversations. But in the face of ongoing conflict and exploitation and oppression, we know that we can't turn inward and be silent. That we must instead engage our neighbors, proclaim our faith values, and pursue justice in our communities. You know, we as United Methodists have a phrase for this, and we call it social holiness. Social holiness. And it's rooted in our biblical understanding of what we believe the world to be like. And it's based upon John Wesley's own movement for change uh, just over 250 years ago. And we built upon our great DNA as the United Methodists for social change through acts of personal, societal, and civic righteousness. That is where we can reflect the love of Christ. I, 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 I'm going to give you something on your way out today. I'm going to give you something. This is uh, put out by the Church and Society of the United Methodist Church, one of the many ways in which we engage in public discourse and one of the many ways in which we engage in not just prayerful people, as important as they may be, but we are prayerful and we know that that prayer leads us to action. And so on your way out, you'll receive this great resource. It's from this toolkit for faithful civic engagement. You'll receive this in your emails on Tuesday. Um, as well with a whole lot of other resources to use, uh, because I feel like throughout this week we've gotten many text messages and phone calls and emails saying, Pastor, what do we do next? Do we open up our sanctuary for prayer? Do we go and march? Do we stay silent? And I think this is maybe our place to start. And so you'll receive this kind of document that's called a writing to decision makers. And I think one of the ways that we can engage in this is by writing or by calling those who do make decisions that we elect. Um, And it kind of gives you a a language to use. I am not going to tell you what to write, though. I don't feel like that is my duty. But I encourage you to fill in your own personal experience, your own ask, your own thank you and follow up as a part of this. And on the other side, there's also an example that does not have to do with gun violence on this, but has to do with immigration. But it kind of gives you maybe language to use or a place to start. Because although we may feel overwhelmed and hurt, it doesn't mean that we can stay dormant and silent. So as you exit today, I'll give you one of these on your way out as a prayer for reflection for you um, to determine what is your next step as a person of faith who holds equality and justice for all as a deep within our own bones as divine image bearers. My prayer I'm going to use today as part of our offertory prayer and part of my pastoral prayer for us is a liturgy. It's one of my favorite uh, prayer books. When I feel like I don't have words to pray, this is where I go. Um, It's called Every Moment Holy. It's a great prayer book, a couple different selections. But this one is called A Liturgy for Grieving a National Tragedy. And it gives me words and comfort and also of compassion and engagement. And that's my prayer for you too. So would you pray with me? O God, who gathers what has been scattered, shelter us now in the shadow of your wings. O Christ, who binds our wounds, be our great healer. O Spirit, who enters our every grief, intercede now for this hurting people in this broken land. Be present in the midst of this far-reaching pain. O Lord, for we are reeling again at news of another loss of life that touches us all. News of flourishing diminished, of individuals harmed, of pain imposed, not only upon victims and their families who bear now the immediate brunt of it, but also upon our nation. For we are connected as a people, and this hurt, this grief, touches us all. Engage our imaginations and move our hearts to compassion, O Lord that we may interact with these casualties not as news stories or statistics, but as our own sisters and brothers, flesh and blood, divine image bears irreplaceable individuals who lo- whose losses will leave gaping holes in homes, friendships, 
workplaces, churches, schools, organizations, and neighborhoods. You do not run from our brokenness, O God. You move ever towards those in need. Your heart is always inclined towards those who suffer. Now let your mercies be active through the hands, the words, and the compassionate care of those who willingly enter this sadness to console and to serve. Be with all who move towards this need, the helpers, the counselors, the therapists, the first responders, those who offer aid and protection, the pastors and intercessors, those who meet immediate practical needs, those who seek to heal physical wounds, and those who come after to carry on the long, hard work of rebuilding families and hearts and lives and community. Even in the shadow of such tragedy, let us not lose hope. Give us eyes to see the rapid movements of mercy rushing to fill these newly wounded spaces. Let us see in this the echoes of your own mercy and compassion, a foretaste of your kingdom coming to earth, and move our own hearts also, equipping us to intercede, to act, and to respond however we are able. Move, O Holy Spirit, in the midst of and in the aftermath of this tragedy, in the wake of our own wounding, and the shock, and the sorrow. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's beloved children said, Amen. We now respond to the gratitude of our own hearts to what God is doing. Trusting and having confidence that God is working here through Watkins and the people that claim to be Watkins. As we come and we minister, not only in this place, but also in our city and beyond. That's why we give. And so if you'd like, if you're in person, the plates will be coming around. There's also Venmo and a QR code inside of your bulletin to scan if you'd like to do that kind of online digital giving. If you're online with us, there's also a give button on our website on the top right. We do ask that you'll give abundantly, generously, just as God gives abundantly and generously to each one of us. Let us respond. Bye. 
night still I'm found Leaves the night behind Why could you earn it? I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away All the overwhelming Never ending Reckless love of God on children's moment. I'm going to have to do it again. Okay, with energy and excitement like Doug normally does it. Doug, you're my example today. Good morning. Colin! Uh, Woo! I might have a, just a, a, little bit, a little bit lower. Good morning. My name is Colin Higgs and I'm the pastor of children and youth here at Watkins and I'd like to just say welcome. Normally I'm doing the, the children's moment and I always regret now using the word cheeseburger to sit down because now I'm just hungry. I'm ready for lunch. <laughs> but before we open our scripture today, would you please join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful crowd of people. Thank you for this fellowship and this opportunity not only to worship to you but to, to learn more about you and to grow closer to you. I ask that as we enter this time of opening your word that we also open our hearts and our minds, that we are transformed and that we see you in a different way and that we may act in the world to bring about not only peace but justice and love. In the name of Jesus Christ, everyone said, Amen. So our scripture today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. 
But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, as a kid, I was really jealous of my friends. When it came time for spring break, all my friends would head to the ocean, get to enjoy it, get to get shark tooth or seashell necklaces. They'd have those really cool t-shirts with the graffiti on them that spray your name. I mean, a really big tourist trap, but it looked really fun when they came back with a tan. But while they were out playing in the ocean, I was visiting Abraham Lincoln's house. I was visiting historical tours of different cities. I was going to revolutionary war forts because my family, they loved historical sites. Their vacation was to learn more, to engage more with history. But as a kid, that was always slightly boring until I got like the sailor's cap or, you know, the cool, you know, little trinkets you can get. But it was just so astonishing that all my friends got to play around, make these huge sand castles, and I was coming back to know that, you know, Abraham Lincoln was shot on April 14th, and that's it. I learned new facts. And what I realized when developing the sermon was that our history as America isn't very long. We have only been around for a couple hundred years. And it's in stark contrast to when I got to visit the Holy Land earlier this year. The moment I stepped onto the the Holy Land and visiting the Sea of Galilee and Capernaum and Jerusalem and all these wonderful places in Israel and Palestine, I realized that they had hundreds of thousands of years worth of history, of different cultures, different peoples. And I was awestruck to be standing there, to be walking on those stones, to breathing the same air, to being in the same place as Jesus was. We were astonished not only at its greatness and grandeur, but that's what drawing close to something awesome will do. There's this unique inspiration to be found when we are absolutely amazed, almost as if you're standing on Mount Everest surveying the entire world. And this is the, precisely the dynamic that occurs in our own hearts. When we draw near to God's starkest display of the cross of Jesus Christ, The book of 1 Corinthians is about how to have unity in a divided church. And God uses foolishness and humor to demonstrate his love and grace for all and to show us the salvation of the cross. I'm going to read again one of our verses when Paul writes, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Paul uses the word foolishness five times in these verses. Now, it would help to know that the basic Greek word is moria, and I want to say it like that just so you all know I'm taking my academics seriously and going to class and learning a few things. But in verse 25, it's used as an adjective, moros. Now, I probably don't have to tell you that that sounds really close to the English word moron. Now, something of the idea that is so ridiculous, it is so scandalous, But if someone were to say, you moron, you might be insulted. And I know that no one in this room has ever said it or will say it, right? Can we nod our heads and agree? Yeah. But you'll probably feel insulted if someone says it to you. That's the very word that Paul uses here. Not just once, but five times. Now, what Paul is saying is most people consider the cross to be moronic. That is, when Paul is writing this, they consider the cross to be dumb to be foolish. Now, there are countless reasons for this, but at the top of the list is that the cross calls us away from sin and into God's grace, into his mercy. That the work of the cross is that salvation is freely granted unto us, not not by human merit, but by God's grace. And this grace is not only for one group of people, whether it's the Greeks or the Jews, but all peoples from nations and different backgrounds and experiences. This makes us all equal at the foot of the cross, that everyone comes to God through faith. Now, as a Christian, we don't see this as foolishness or scandalous, for we see the cross as the power of God, that the work of the cross is not simply good advice or helpful information. It is God's gift unto us. In other words, the cross gives life. 
It gives security, justice, and peace. It brings joy. The cross, as Christians, is our foundation. Theologians Laurel Schneider and Nikki Young share this quote about 1 Corinthians. They say it was God's confounding departure from the standard rules of order, hierarchy, and power for humans and deities that was important to Paul. Because he saw the whole Jesus narrative as a revelation of another order, an apocalyptic alterity, a better world about to be ushered in. See, in the real world, we question of, how could one worship a God who is immune to pain? Someone that when we look at the cross, when we see a lonely figure, when we see that he was tortured, dehumanized, brow bleeding from the thorns, thirsty, and plunged into darkness, we understand that God sets aside his immunity to pain. He enters our world of flesh and blood, tears, and death. But within the cross, a world is not just transformed. Instead, it's completely new. It's different. It's beautiful. It's holy and sacred. I think a lot of times when you struggle with that image, with that dream of the cross, because we don't know what it might look like to be living into it. We create stumbling blocks that take us maybe just a step back, maybe because we're just a little bit afraid. But Paul uses the Jews as an example because they were looking for miracles. They wanted God to provide proof. But you see, Jesus, not Jesus, Jewish history is filled with miraculous events, all the way from the Exodus out of Egypt to the days of Elijah and Elisa. Then when Jesus was ministering on earth, the Jewish leaders repeatedly asked him, please perform a sign for us. But instead he refuses. Because we all understand that they were looking for a political leader who would deliver them from the heel of the Roman Empire. They simply could not imagine a crucified Messiah. Someone who would become criminalized and dehumanized to defeat death and give life back to us in humanity. But I think it's difficult to understand what crucifixion meant to the Jews. We've sanitized the cross, almost domesticated it. If we want a modern counterpart, we might think of the death penalty. The the thought of someone being killed in a sentence as a criminal. We want to keep that away from us because it might just make us sick. It's icky. It's uncomfortable. But that's what the cross meant for Jesus. That's why the cross is so scandalous. Because how could anyone put faith in an unemployed carpenter from Nazareth who died a shameful death as a common criminal? They looked for the Messiah who would come like a mighty warrior and defeat all their enemies. He then set up his kingdom and return glory back unto Israel. And this was the attitude of the Jews because their emphasis was on holding power, holding power over the people around them, and the cross appeared weak. But on the other hand, Paul identifies the Greeks with wisdom, that people think that they might submit to God as soon as they can figure him out. I remember last week I was at Applebee's with friends and my my roommates just said the most ridiculous fact in the world. I don't remember what it was. But, you know, 10 years ago, if I said something like that to my parents, my parents have to wait to go home, open a dictionary, find it online, on their home computer. But what I did last week is I pulled out my phone, typed into Google, and saw if it was real or fake immediately. Unfortunately, the Greeks didn't have iPhones. But they also didn't practice crucifixion. So they didn't have the same kind of problems with the cross that the Jews did. They looked at philosophy as the answer to life's deepest problems. And that contradicted when you think of a man hanging on a cross as in saving the world. It didn't line up with what their beliefs were, what their wisdom was. To them it was foolish. To them it didn't make any sense. It required faith and maybe a little bit of mysticism. There was no logic to it. But even today, we still study the profound writings of Greek philosophers today. But while Paul uses the Greeks and Jews as examples of not understanding the cross, they understood love. They understood bonds and relationships and the sacrifice required to sustain them, to be in them. 
And I think I found this bond as a kid, or at least a, a really good example of it, in this phenomenal movie called Brother Bear. <laughs> Have you all heard of it before? Yeah, maybe. Do you all like it? I'm hoping that's a yes. You all are kind of quiet today. But I will say, you know, I give this dig on Pastor Rob in the first service. I do believe it is the best Disney movie and not The Lion King. <laughs> but the main character, Kenai, is about to get his totem to signify his coming of age in the movie. And he gets a totem he doesn't want, the bear of love. Now, if I was in the movie and I was getting a totem, I might want the eagle of might or something that sounds epic or cool or, or strong. And Kenai is the same way. He doesn't like his totem. So after a bear attacks and ends up killing his older brother, he ends up becoming a bear. And so he's told to seek the mountain of spirits to gain his human form back. But he runs into a little bit of an issue. He runs into another bear named Coda, searching for his mom. After a wonderful journey serenaded by Phil Collins and exploring the wonderful world of Brother Bear, the truth comes out. Kenai was responsible for Coda's mom's death. And so that is a, a hard fact to deal with. But in the end, he ends up remaining a bear in order to take care of Coda. Because he understands his totem of love was best, not only for his original community, but his new family, his new brother. Kenai, who at the beginning of the movie, who is questioning his future and probably questioning having siblings at all, finally understood that he needed to be relied on as a brother. That he needed to have a brother, to love onto someone else. That even as a bear... He needed an intimate bond. And that's where we come back to the cross. That when all else fails, we can go back to the cross and bond around our love for the one who died for us there. That ultimately, all that we believe is wrapped up in Christ's cross. It is the central truth of Christian faith and the preeminent event of human history. This cross is our message, our hope, our confidence, it's our badge of honor and our emblem of suffering and shame. Even though the world might despise the cross, we rally to it. Therefore, let us love the cross. Let us preach the cross. Stand by the cross and never be ashamed of it. Let us hold it high as a banner of our salvation and lift it up as hope of the world. For there is no love greater than the power that comes from that cross. It is the only power that can lift people out of darkness and deliver them freedom with God. It is the only power that can build a just kingdom without harm, pain, or sorrow, which gives us new life, which heals our old wounds, which transforms us and delivers us into a holier and greater world than the day before. Would you all please bow your heads in prayer with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for your, your actions upon the cross. That because of the cross, we are given new life, new opportunity to help others, to provide peace and love and joy across the world. I ask that we step outside of these doors and maybe we're heading to a family lunch or maybe we're just going home, that we continue to share that love. Continue to understand the cross not as a weapon against others, but instead a helping hand. Something that builds others up and builds us closer, not only to you, but to one another. And I say all these good things. Amen. Would you all please stand for our final song, The Goodness of God.
the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am. In darkest nights, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life. If you have been faithful, all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. Give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. Give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I'm gonna say of the goodness of God. Thank you. That is my favorite song. <laughs> that is my favorite worship song. Goodness of God. Okay, so one announcement before we head out is that we are collecting UMCOR hygiene kits that they provide basic necessity to those who are most vulnerable during times of crisis. So they are distributed during disasters, whether they are socioeconomic or as a result of a natural occurrence. So if you would like to see more information on what a hygiene kit looks like, there's a table right outside that, do we have a sign up for? There's a, there's a, there's a sheet out there that has instructions. There we go, there's a seat with instructions out there. So hear this benediction that I just put back in my pocket. <laughs> we proclaim the crucified and risen Christ, who is power and wisdom of God. May Christ strengthen us and give us wisdom. So go forth in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.